Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta. and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm gonna let you know a little bit about a, I wanna call it, <laughs> an almost connected podcast to the one that you're listening to right now. I know many of you guys listen to this on YouTube, and even still, I suggest you guys check it out on your most convenient podcast app so that you can also check out the podcast I'm about to mention right now. Monsters Among Us True Paranormal Stories. I know a lot of you guys like coming over here and listening to stories that I'll tell you from numerous authors around the internet. All of these are considered to be fiction, unless I state otherwise. However, Monsters Among Us tells specifically true paranormal stories. And for those of you that believe, this is an incredible listen from beginning to end. Not to mention I know many of you like longer stories and Monsters Among Us each episode is roughly an hour or so. The latest episode that I listened to was from Season 13, Episode 6, Sketchy UFOs, Doppelgangers, and Old School Dogman. You guys will probably recognize some of these things from topics that we've talked about in fiction. However, what makes Monsters Among Us really interesting is that they take actual calls from people, and you can hear some actual accounts, as well as some real information about the monsters and ghouls that exist among us. Not to mention the host voice is just cool. The guy sounds like he's got that gravelly velvet that's just amazing to listen to. I kind of understand what you guys always say whenever you listen to my stories and tell me that the voice is soothing, because Monsters Among Us has had that kind of effect on me as well. Not to mention, the stories told have a very chilling effect. It's not the same like listening to specifically my podcast, although I would like to say, continue to listen if you enjoy it, but... Knowing that these are true accounts, knowing that these are the voices of callers who have experienced something paranormal in real life, that is pretty incredible. That is a level of fear, a level of horror that I don't think I could touch, even if I tried to with voice acting. I think there's a level of realism there without having to get into, say, true crime murders and such. Something that feels a little scarier since this is not something that we entirely understand. And I think that is the real appeal of Monsters Among Us. That the things that are out there are not something you can easily explain away. And beyond just fiction, beyond just interesting stories with a plot line and characters, these are real people who have seen real things that go beyond our regular understanding of human life. So, if you guys would like to check out this podcast, I'm going to have a link in the description down below. I'll make sure that that's on the podcast. I'll make sure that that's on the YouTubes. And now, on to tonight's story. Set against the raw beauty of Lake Michigan in the late 1800s, If you looked across the water, you would often see a dazzling spectacle. Sleek, three-masted schooners running smoothly on a western wind. Day in, day out, for the days of motor vehicles. Almost two thousand of these prized vessels reliably brought goods for a large portion of the Midwest. However, those placid waters could have a dark side. Often in late autumn, the winds would pick up and the lakes would become death traps for sailors. Prayers would be offered up every time a new voyage went out, but many times they went unanswered. Some say that the Great Lakes were the most treacherous during late November, and perhaps none could testify to that more so than the Rouse Simmons. The Rouse Simmons was built in Milwaukee in 1868 by Allen McClellan and Company and named after a Kenosha businessman. After it finished construction, the schooner was soon purchased by a wealthy lumber magnate, Charles H. Hackley, of Muskegon, Michigan, and became just another cog in his large fleet. Hackley's ships served across most of Lake Michigan's coastline, and the Rouse Simmons was no exception, soon transforming into a workhorse, shipping lumber from company mills to several ports around the lake for another 20 years. At its peak, the schooner was making weekly runs between Grand Haven and Chicago. It was the pinnacle of what was considered a large-capacity ship for shallow waters at the time, 
often tackling over 53 tons of lumber at a time to the insatiable demand of Chicago's growing industry. And no greater need was there than at Christmas time. It was shrewd businessman Herman Schumann who eventually used the ship for his new venture in trading fine fir trees that had been cut in the northern parts of Ontario. Often he would tout that his prices were lower than any competitors, and he would even give some of the trees to families that couldn't afford them. Some became affectionately endeared to the sailor, and even would call him Captain Santa for his larger-than-life persona during the winter months. He'd be seen taking to the helm himself to make sure that the hall made it to Chicago in time for the holiday. He was a remarkable individual, and one that history will remember. But not for all the reasons you may think. The whole thing started before Herman really had any skin in the game. You see, by the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the popular German tradition of decorating an evergreen tree in the home was widely practiced, and demand for Christmas trees was great, you see. It was not uncommon for a handful of lake schooners to make late-season runs from northern Michigan and Wisconsin before the worst storms and ice made the lake travel too hazardous. They were loaded with thousands of Christmas trees for busy Chicago waterfront markets. Estimates of the number of Christmas schooners vary, but perhaps up to two dozen vessels in any season delivered evergreens to markets in the Great Lakes. Herman saw an opportunity and continued to ship trees even during some of the worst storms. In Chicago, most vessels, including the Rouse Simmons, sold their trees directly from their berths along the Chicago River's Clark Street docks, Electric lights would be strung from the schooner's bow to stern, and customers were invited to board the ship and choose their tree. In addition to selling Christmas trees, many boat operators, including Schumann, made and sold wreaths, garlands, and other holiday decorations. Barbara Schumann and her three daughters helped make and sell these items as part of the family's holiday trade. Truthfully, you couldn't find a more Christian family than theirs in that day and age. Although when Captain Santa would face those dangerous waters against the warning of family and friends, one might wonder whether he was truly honoring the blood of Christ and celebrating his birth. The first tragedy hit in 1898. On November 9th of that year, death marred the Schunemann holiday season, when just one month after the birth of twins Hazel and Pearl, Herman's older brother, August Schunemann, died while sailing a load of Christmas trees to Chicago aboard the schooner's Estal. The 52-ton, two-masted schooner built in Milwaukee in 1867 broke up after it was caught in a storm near Glencloe, Illinois. There were likely dozens of men on board. There were no survivors. The Schunemann family was devastated. But Herman continued the family tradition of making late-season Christmas tree runs, a decision that would soon make fate run its course for him as well. Curiously, August only had obtained the ship mere weeks before the accident, purchasing it on an auction. Some suggested that perhaps he didn't understand how to properly sail the massive boat, as it had been quite some time since he had been a captain. The same was not true for Herman. Even after his brother died, he stayed true to the seas for three decades, even after filing for bankruptcy, he refused to give up what he called his life's calling. The seas would call to him. It would be easy to scoff at the superstitions held by sailors, easy to raise one's eyebrows in amusement when hearing of the omens sailors were convinced would determine their fate, while sailing on the open waters to pass each off with a laugh. But to the men who devoted their lives to shipping, who grasped with white-knuckled hands as their boat was tossed like a bathtub toy during a tumultuous storm. These beliefs were more than mere folklore. They were a matter of life and death. Superstitions were not passed off lightly, but were deeply held beliefs. In the blink of an eye or waiting for a moment too long could mean the end of your life. For sailors of the Great Lakes, these superstitions were handed down from generation to generation, passed along by old salts who could read the world around them like a book 
We could hear its voice, silent to most, but not to all. Taking note of the happenings on and around a ship was nearly a religious practice. Everything was watched with a trained and careful eye. The sky, the wind, the waves. Many claimed that Captain Santa had heard many omens that this would be his last voyage. He was not a superstitious man, though, instead choosing to let his fate be chosen by the waves. He was not the only one, either, that had these ill tidings. Alvida, the daughter of Captain Charles Nelson, who was the partner to Herman, told the Record Herald that her father had a premonition the night before they sailed. Something terrible was going to happen. She pleaded with her father not to sail with Shuneman on that Friday, but Nelson said that he had given his word to Shuneman and could not back out. Captain Charles had been a lake captain for fifty years and did try to persuade Herman to delay, but he could not convince him. Herman didn't want to take the risk of being iced into the harbor, having his ship dashed against the docks by gale-force winds. Alvita would never see her father alive again. Both men had promised their wives this would be their last run across the lakes. Perhaps it was a foretelling of what was to come. Interviews were made of some of the residents of Thompson, Michigan, near where the Rouse Simmons had docked before making its return trip to Chicago. The residents there said that they loved Captain Schumann, and the feeling was mutual. Often these were the families he would pass out gifts to as he was getting ready to leave. In fact, one of his last acts before setting sail to Chicago was to give away candy to the children of the town. He normally would have wrapped presents for them, but with finances being so tight, he admitted this was all he could afford. Some took this as yet another sign that this voyage should be cancelled. A number of residents claimed that they pleaded with Shuneman to not set sail and to wait out the storm. But according to those interviews, made for a 1975 Milwaukee television documentary, Shuneman stated that the people in Chicago have to have their trees for Christmas. He supposedly said this as he was watching rats deserting his ship. The significance of that would be great if Captain Santa actually knew what the omens meant. Rats are considered by some to be the wisest of mariners. Rodents would often avoid water at all costs. They could scurry around in areas that are largely unseen and inaccessible to humans. You never know what they noticed about this ship. That is probably why when rats leave ships in a hurry, you know it's considered a bad omen, and in the seafaring circles, one of the worst possible omens, Amos Tacon said in his interview. The mood on the docks was tense and foreboding. Tempers flared. Many were worried because they were leaving on a Friday. According to the Ocean Almanac by Robert Hackerson, the British Navy tried to dispel the Friday superstition in the 1800s when they intentionally laid the keel of a new ship on a Friday, launching it on a Friday set it to sail on a Friday, and then went so far as to name the ship Friday. What happened next came as little surprise to most. Neither the ship nor her crew was ever heard from again. They vanished into thin air. There were at least two sailors who refused to sail back on the Rouse Simmons due to both the impending storms, the Friday schedule, and the fact that the rats were leaving in droves. This was very serious since the sailors were not paid if they did not complete the voyage. In short, they were returning to their families with nothing. The two sailors, some accounts mention three sailors, but the exact number is not known, were Hogan Hoganson and Big Bill Sullivan, whose real name was William F. Teets. Hogan Hoganson was interviewed by the Chicago Intern Ocean in 1967, and he testified to the fact that he witnessed the rats leaving the ship and when the younger sailors saw that he was going back by train, they laughed at him. They didn't laugh for long after that, Hogan proclaimed. Perhaps an even stronger portent of his fate was related to the number 13. Of course, it's not merely sailors that say this number is dangerous. Often citing it connects to Judas Iscariot, the one that betrayed Christ. 
Many sailors have refused to set sail when there are only 13 men aboard. And according to most reports, there were only that many souls aboard when the ship departed for Chicago. On Friday, November 22, 1912, the Rouse Simmons heavily laden with nearly 5,000 Christmas trees, filling its cargo hold and covering its deck, left the dock at Thompson, Michigan. Some eyewitnesses to its departure claimed the ship looked like a floating forest. It was a startling sight to see it moving across the water like an island alive. Schunemann's choice to go, however, coincided with the beginnings of a tremendous winter storm on the lake that sent several other ships to the bottom, including the South Shore, three sisters, and two brothers. These ships had all been captained by veterans as well, and yet now found themselves at the bottom of the lakes. This did not deter Herman, though, and he kept going forward despite the clear signs of danger. The temperature immediately dropped from 40 degrees to below freezing. Rain turned to snow and ice, which coated the ship's rigging, sails, and spars, and the Christmas trees that were on the deck. What happened next is a mystery, but it was something seriously unexpected. Something deadly. In their final minutes, the Rouse Simmons had thrown out the schooner's port anchor into Lake Michigan, hoping to hold her into the wind, archaeologists later discovered. Yet nothing could stop Mother Nature from unleashing its fury. Last seen by the Kiwane life-saving station, the Rouse Simmons was flying a distress flag five miles offshore while being driven southward by a northwest gale. With no chance of catching the fleeing vessel, the Kiwane station's captain telephoned the Two Rivers life-saving station, 25 miles to the south. The station immediately launched a lifeboat to intercept the distressed vessel and bring her crew to safety. When the lifeboat motored onto the lake, however, the Rouse Simmons had vanished. In studying historic documents, it was discovered that contrary to the popular story that materialized around the Simmons' loss, the vessel was under clear conditions. She was not, as legend has it, last seen by the life-saving crew, encrusted with ice, through a fleeting window and a vicious snowstorm. By recreating the search pattern of the Two Rivers lifeboat and comparing it with Rouse Simmons' location to this day, the WHS deduced that the Two Rivers lifeboat completely encircled the Rouse Simmons it was never more than a few miles from where she lay at the bottom of the lake. With a reported six miles of visibility that day, if the ship were still afloat, as the lifeboat rounded Two Rivers Point at 4.20 p.m., the life-saving crew would have seen her. Additionally, the snowstorm that many lake captains reported as the worst they had ever seen may well have been terrible, but it began around 5 p.m., well after the Rouse Simmons would have been on the bottom. In the days following her disappearance, clues were slow to come. Christmas trees, believed to be from the wreck, washed up along the shores of Michigan and Wisconsin that December, and they were brought up in fishing nets for years to come. When the wreck was discovered, further evidence was made to prove that their luck had run out. A horseshoe nailed to the craft with its open end pointing up in order to hold the luck in is one particular item that was found. It is said that if it is upside down, or in an inverted U position, it means the ship's luck is running out. Expert scuba diver Gordon Kent Bell Richard in October of 1971 claimed to find the horseshoe hanging upside down by a single nail. Of course, it's unclear if the horseshoe was in this position before the ship sank, or if it gradually settled in this position after being submerged in 172 feet of water for nearly 60 years. Either way, it did seem as though the aging ship's luck had definitely run out. Not a soul made it off that ship. On the 6th of December, 1912, 13 days after the last sighting of the Rouse Simmons, the Milwaukee Sentinel reported that a Captain William Baxter of the Cursarge heard some vessels sounding its bell just before sighting the vessel. Many sailors believe those to be what are known as phantom bells. The ship's bell was often used to indicate a particular time, or wrong a certain number of times, for a particular tradition. For example, on New Year's, 
Some sailors would ring the bell 16 times to symbolize they were ringing in the new year and disposing of all the old from the year before. When a sailor died, often they would ring eight bells to represent the end of the watch. Baxter said he heard no more than six, inferring that when it echoed, it reminded him of the mark of the wild beast from the revelations to John. It looked nothing like it had only a few weeks ago. Instead, the masts were ripped and torn. One was completely split in two, and it was moving at a speed not possible for a ship so large. Often, these vessels are moving at a steady pace, pushing aside the waves slowly, trying to reach their destination. But this night was different. I saw it race across the horizon, almost like a, like a fire spread over the lake. Baxter refused to speak any further on the incident. It made his entire body shake to its core. Even long after the wreck, for decades, in fact, the ship would be seen. Usually after a storm strong enough to stir up the lake bottom, there would be trees seen on the shores. In the early years, the trees would show up as fresh as the day they were cut, due to being preserved by the frigid Lake Michigan waters. Some claimed it was as though the trees had been protected by the angels themselves. People would gather them up and decorate them for Christmas, saying a prayer of thanks to the ghostly captain that they had delivered them. In much later years, the trees would turn up as skeletons, not a fir left on their branches. But even then, the trees would be cut into thin slices, and then they would be decorated as ornaments. It has often been said that Captain Santa was still delivering his load of Christmas trees, even in death. But not all stories are pleasant ones. An anonymous sailor recounted a story that he had heard from his great-uncle. His great-uncle was born in 1909, just three years before the Rouse Simmons was lost. He grew up near the area and would go down to the Point Beach Lighthouse to pick up choke cherries from the trees near there. He told his nephew that people would go down to the lake shore, usually on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, just before dawn, and try to catch a glimpse of the ghost ship during the 1930s. It was described as an old ship with tattered sails that would just bob on the waves. Others said that it was only the bones of the ship, hardly kept together at all except by the sheer spirit of the crew. Someone would see the ship and it would just disappear in a moment. But other times, he said that many people would claim to see a person waving a lighted lantern back and forth on the deck. One resident had this to say. Tied to the deck by the Christmas lights. They had once been used to decorate the vessel. Now it was proving to be the final chains for the captain that had devoted his life to the sea. It used to come along in a fog when it was abreast of the coast. The breeze would die out chill would come over the water, and the vessel passing would seem to shiver as its salts hung idle. The specter crew stood at the guns, and the foghorn was moaning. They would sometimes be said to be singing Christmas hymns. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and take us to heaven to live with thee there. And from the masthead flew the sigil, cannot rest until avenged. I'll never forget the life that was drained from his eyes. The sheer anger and frustration and pain that the bones held as it sailed across the lake doomed to continue to deliver those trees for all eternity as he failed to listen to the warnings given. Barbara Shinneman passed away in 1933 and was buried at Arcadia Cemetery on Irving Park Road in Chicago. Herman's listed on her stone, but his body was never discovered. The only item of his to ever be recovered was a tattered old wallet. Coincidentally, the small harbor ship that found the wallet was called 
reindeer. Perhaps another omen connected to the horrible holiday season. Two of his daughters, Elise Roberts and Hazel Groenman, are also buried in the plot, alongside their graves. But they're unmarked because of the bankruptcy that struck the family after Herman's death. Barbara did try to continue the tradition of delivering trees even after her husband's death, but because of the massive storm, it caused a change in attitude towards sailing during that time of year. Because of this, Barbara died perhaps more poor than the needy families that she often gave trees to in memory of her husband. The Schunemann Stone has a single evergreen tree in the center, and people claim that they can sometimes smell freshly cut Christmas trees when visiting the gravesite. If you have the opportunity to visit the site and walk toward it, you'll likely catch a smell of freshly cut evergreen. Your heart will likely jump a little, just by the unnatural smell, even when it's not holiday time. Some have also said they found a blanket of evergreen branches that were laid upwind on top of a grave that was about 30 feet away that was able to trace the smell to the gravesite. No one knows for sure where it comes from, or even if they are of this world. The wreck of the Rouse Simmons was discovered in 1971, as mentioned before. They found that there were still needless skeleton-like trees in the cargo hold, the same ones that are said are found on the grave. In the year that it had disappeared, newspapers ran with the headline that this was a year without Christmas. A note was later found from the first mate of the Rouse Simmons. These lines written at 10.30 p.m., schooner R.S., ready to go down about 20 miles southwest of Two Rivers Point, between 15 to 20 miles offshore. All hands lashed to one line. Goodbye. Nelson. Perhaps the darkest message was one found in a bottle from the Rouse Simmons, washed onto the shore at Sheboygan, Wisconsin, sometime after its sinking. It had been corked using a small piece of cut pine tree. How long it had bobbed along the waters is unknown. The message reads, Friday. Everybody, goodbye. I guess we are all through. During the night, the small boat washed overboard, leaking bad. Involved and Steve lost too. God help us. But God did not listen. Times have been tough for me, so I haven't quite updated everything as I would have liked in the past couple of months. I'm finally getting back to the swing of things as my life continues to normalize. So I appreciate you guys sticking with me, and honestly, I see all of your comments and your support as I've been talking about what's been happening with me, and I want to tell you all thank you so much for that, because duh, it's been rough, and seeing your support has been life-saving. So thank you all so much for it. And as always... I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon. And I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Donna Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Ika Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Cordy Kenshin, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Miver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Set Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jay Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kids, Cryolinian, Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kyle, Psychomel, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon, thank you all so, so much, and to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>